Good morning. Thank you for being here. My name is Bobby Hollinsworth. I'm going to go ahead and get started at 11.15. Um, this is stopwatch session number three, so hopefully you're in the right spot. Um, if you're not unfamiliar with the format, we have five fantastic presentations. Um, I'm going to let them go in just a second here. They're going to have six minutes, and after that we should have a good ten minute buffer to ask any questions that you may have. So we'll let you have at it. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Andrea Worth, and I'm at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. Um, I'm going to be talking to you about library support for citizen science. So, first of all, what is citizen science? Descriptions of citizen science projects include participatory, collaborative, community based, and crowdsourced words. Generally speaking, citizen science refers to members of the public participating in research as volunteers and frequently under the guidance of a researcher. Activities often include data collection, but can cover much more of the research life cycle. Regardless, there's not a universal definition of citizen science. Additionally, some of you might be wondering about the use of the word citizen, since this may imply citizenship in it as a particular requirement, participation requirement, excuse me. Um, I found that the phrase citizen science was the best way to find English language, library guides, and literature on this topic. <clears throat> However, I'll be using uh, citizen and participatory science interchangeably today. So I care about participatory science at the library conference or in a library. My interest in this was to investigate ways that I might incorporate it into my work as a scholarly communication librarian. Um, and I was also interested in investigating if there is a connection with the Carnegie, Carnegie Community Engagement Classification, which describes uh, collaboration between institutions of higher education and their larger communities for the mutually beneficial exchange of knowledge and resources. So next, I'm going to share some examples of what I've found so far as I looked at other ways U uh, U.S. academic libraries have incorporated citizen science into their work. So I've looked at the content of over 40 libraries, websites, and libguides for substantive coverage of citizen science. Of those, 10 had discoverable coverage on the topic that provided some context or resource links, typically on a li library guide. And since each of us is in a different place in regard to our interest in and capacity for sharing, uh, supporting citizen science, I am sharing three loosely grouped approaches among those 10 libraries. The first is embedded. I came to citizen science as a participant first, uh, and then started to think about whether the data and other research outputs from those projects are openly available. Therefore, including citizen science within open access and open science projects made a lot of sense to me and frankly was where I expected to find uh, most of the libraries in this review to cover the participatory sciences. Arizona State University and the University <coughs> of Houston did just that by embedding citizen science descriptions and projects in their open science guides. Similarly, Oklahoma State includes a citizen science as part of their guide on government information research support. <coughs> the next group focused on more specific areas of citizen science, thus not a comprehensive overview of citizen science itself, but covering a related topic in its own right. Research services related to spatial data, mapping, and other tools featured heavily here. One guide, Public Participatory Mapping from the University of Illinois Chicago, which is shown on the screen, showcases resources for non-experts to create their own spatial data. The University of Oregon emphasizes the tools of citizen science, several of which are GIS and data analysis related. A third website, which is part of the Share OK Institutional Repository, demonstrates the library's role as a partner in a specific citizen science project, in this case, citizen science soil collection. Finding connections between existing complementary research services, such as software training, spatial data support, and institutional repositories, could be a route for libraries to include participatory science in their work. So the final group is the libraries with comprehensive coverage of participatory science. Comprehensive coverage is just a term I'm using to convey that at a minimum the information is presented as a standalone topic and that the information includes a definition or introduction, resources including library collections, and references to relevant organizations, activities, and project directories such as SciStarter. Iowa State and the University of Utah guides appeared in the same hierarchy as topic or subject guides and helped orient the reader to what citizen science is all about. They both included library and external resources that would help readers learn more. Some of these resources were to local projects, such as Iowa's annual crane <coughs> camp, 
and to international organizations such as the Citizen Science Association. So this leads me into the tips that I've gathered from this project so far. Um, so first, uh, the example libraries demonstrate that citizen science fits with library services and in fact fits with a variety of different library services. Those can be related to data and GIS, government information, open science, and more. And looking closely at these examples, earth science and biology are the disciplines most commonly associated with the project links. And some of those links are to local efforts, thus creating hopefully that community connection. This leads me to another point in that the directories referenced in these guides, such as SciStarter, are valuable in finding pro projects in need of participants. There are some areas that I expected to find citizen science more fully integrated and have not yet. In short, I found few subject guides that mention citizen science, and most that did pointed to a small number of resources and or mentioned citizen science without really describing the practice or context. I also did not find citizen science data sets as resources for researchers seeking data, specific connections to the Carnegie classification or similar, or academic libraries leading or facilitating efforts uh, they describe as citizen science projects, although I am aware that a few public libraries do lead these efforts and therefore was looking for similar examples. With that, I'll conclude with the links to the library guides and directories referenced in this presentation. Um, I very much appreciate these libraries in particular, so you discover both their citizen science uh, work that they've done. Um, and with that, uh, thank you. We'll look for questions later. Silton. I'm the Electronic Resources Librarian at ZSR Library at Wake Forest University, um, and I've been on, in this role for seven months. Um, I'm situated on the library's technology team, and my job is primarily focused on access and discovery with um, colleagues and the resource services team handling licensing and acquisitions. Um, and I've been doing e-resources work in different libraries for 15 years. Hi, I'm Kathy Shields. I'm a research and instruction librarian and our research services lead, which means I coordinate our liaison program and help support collection development on the um, liaison side of things. Um, I'm on our research instruction and outreach team that I've been at uh, CSR, as we are affectionately known for um, uh, seven and a half years. And now we're going to show a bit about how we have been working together over the past seven months to support research selection, access and discovery, and a bit about our future plans. So after 2020, uh, we consolidated our many, many <laughs> individual department funds into larger disciplinary funds representing social sciences, STEM, humanities, and EDI. Mm -hmm. In my role, I work with the liaisons in each of these groups to identify and advocate for resources within and across these areas. Because liaisons include individuals for whom um, it's a major part of our, our job, like mine, as well as people for whom um, liaison builds one small program and it's part of their other duties I'm assigned, um, their comfort level and capacity for interacting with vendors varies widely. So Kate is able to help bridge that gap for us and serve as a go-between for liaisons with vendors, and she's been able to gather statistics to help us determine whether we should select a particular resource um, and verify what content we have um, across different resources. We also serve together on our library's fairly new collections executive committee, um, which enables us to not only gain a better, bigger picture of what's happening across the library, but also help um, develop and contribute directly to our collection goals and priorities. Uh, so since I'm new to this library and to this process for adding new resources, my goal has been to help facilitate the existing process and to find different ways to support my colleagues in um, Rio, which is Kathy's unit, and also in resource services as they work through the purchasing <coughs> season. Um, as Kathy mentioned, some liaisons set up their own trials, whereas some rely on me to handle it. Um, so I introduced a new process for sharing trial information among the entire group working on adding new resources because we didn't really know the full picture of what we were trialing. Um, so we already have maintained a, a wish list spreadsheet and uh, I found the easiest way to deal with this was to just add a tab for trials, um, which is super simple but it worked really well. Um, this also allows us to track whether or not we've trialed something before, so we're not duplicating work in future years. And as Kathy said, this has been a really great opportunity for me to get to know our liaisons and to learn more about the academic departments that they support. I came from a school with a very STEM heavy STEM focus, whereas Wake's curriculum is more um, 
oriented toward liberal arts. So I'm working with a lot of new products and vendors. Then moving on to access and discovery. Um, so at ZSR, our main access points are Primo, or Primo all in the library. Um, our find a database webpage, part of our WordPress library website, and we, call it, we refer to it as BAD and LibGuides. And FAD had not been reviewed in a while, so over the summer, Kathy and I and our web designer worked to identify some areas for improvement. Um, the list was really long and unwieldy, and we also found our descriptors like subjects and formats were out of date. So we did some research on best practices for maintaining a databases list and learned there wasn't actually a lot of literature out there, but based on what we found, we created some basic selection criteria um, and decided to cull things like single journal and ebook titles, um, generic platform links, and most free and OA resources. Um, and we worked on a process for ensuring access to those resources that we took off the list. Um, and uh, by maintaining persistent links to them, um, to, especially to library license items um, in our uh, LibGuides A to Z list. And we also made sure that all the library license items removed from FAD were discoverable in Primo. And Kathy coordinated working sessions throughout the summer with her colleagues in Rio, so we all had dedicated time to work on the project. So those in-person and virtual sessions that we did, um, which Kate was able to attend, were really great because they gave liaisons a chance to articulate some of their pain points, right? Talk about some of the issues they, that they encountered that they had not really had an outlet for before. And so it brought up a number of lingering issues that we were able to brainstorm and address together, such as resources that weren't showing up in Primo and we did not understand why with all the cataloging rules, where they were going when you would search for them. Resources that had really unique authentication methods, which we have a lot with our business school, and resources that had consolidated or conversely had multiple sub-databases that we were trying to navigate through. So Kate was able to use her expertise to identify and deposit potential solutions, and we were able to share our perspective on what would work best for our users, the faculty and students. Um, we're also able to share how we use our databases list with um, to inform the LibGuides A to Z list and how we use each of those tools differently and sort of articulate our needs for both of those, um, which led to that enhanced workflow that uh, Kate mentioned. And this collaboration really got the ball rolling for us, so to speak, for continuing these discussions and how to improve discovery. So in terms of future plans, um, that includes evaluating exceptions to the FAD criteria that we created based on user input. We got some pushback about things we took out, so we have to figure out how to handle those. Um, we're also planning to set up a more regu regular schedule of reviewing FAD to keep it up to date so we don't, it doesn't become a massive project again. And we're also continuing um, refining the trials workflow. Yeah, and since this will be our first time this academic year working together from the point of trialing and resource selection all the way through to actually purchasing them and discovery, <laughs> um, we want to continue to review and refine that process um, to make sure the appropriate people are notified and that those resources are indeed discoverable and accessible to our users. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is Renna Red and I'm the Collection Sharing and Delivery Librarian at Clemson University, which is fancy code for um, interlibrary loan and getting stuff to people. <laughs> and also I'm the Interim Collections um, Management and Development Coordinator. So here's a little bit about Clemson, I'm not going to go through, but we're a land-grant university um, located in northwest South Carolina, close to Asheville, in between Atlanta and Charlotte. And, um, our library is, I would say it's medium size. We've recently been designated as an R1, and we have four libraries on campus, two off campus, including one here in Charleston and one off site storage facility. So, what is our collection assessment landscape currently? So, the bigger projects are on an ad hoc basis. So, we appoint a group or a person to kind of look over things, but the majority of it is with liaison librarians like my colleague Bobby here and to do a lot of the collection development and assessment work. So um, other collections work has been on, um, you know, with the Stacks team. Um, we also have an information access committee that determines things like budgeting and allocations, but the majority of it has been with the liaisons. So we had a library reorg in 2022 to create a collections and discovery division. 
And within that, there was a head of collections and acquisitions, and also there was an interim collection development management coordinator. It was a 25% position. And I raised my hand and tentatively volunteered to be that person because of my um, perspective from resource sharing. I get to see what people want, what's going out the door in terms of shared collections, and kind of where we stand in comparison with our peers. So with that, I was tasked with looking at what our liaisons are doing and how to kind of ease that burden of assessment. Mm -hmm. So what do we want to accomplish? We, of course, want to make sure that our collections are meeting campus needs. We want to determine what we need to support new programs because we have a new strategic plan campus-wide. We're getting a new vet school. There's not one in the state. Um, and we're also supporting things like rural health and public health. So what can we develop and where? Um, we're also preparing our collection for shared print initiatives as a part of our Pascal which is the partnership among South Carolina academic libraries, we are moving to, e we're joining East. And so we want to make sure that Clemson's collection can carry its own weight in that group. And we are hoping, fingers crossed, I'll pray for us for a library <laughs> renovation <laughs> in the next couple of years. So, you know, we want to know what will we move out? What will we get rid of? What will we relocate off-site storage? What will come back to the building? What will they let us bring back to the building? <laughs> um, all while maximizing the time of the liaisons, because again, a lot of these decisions are still on their plate and they are really busy people. Um, and we want to leverage these other resources from other areas, like I mentioned. So how should we do this? The thing that came to me is three. Is three the magic number? Why three? We have three teams of four liaison librarians in the area of humanities, social sciences, and science. We have three areas of assessment if you want to just break it down and make it overly simplified. So physical collections, electronic resources, and then assessing what our constituents need and what they're satisfied with. And then when we break it down like this, we can try to make it into a three-year project. So again, what does this look like? So in 23-24, our first year, our humanities team is working on um, talking to their patrons. So they decided that they want to create a survey and then go to departmental meetings to figure out, you know, and have some face time with their people. Our science team opted to look at physical collections. So right now we've run some just <coughs> rudimentary, um, you know, reports in Alma. When were things last circulated? You know, just your basic stuff, just to get us off the ground. And when we get our East um, Gold Rush data back at the beginning of the year, we can apply that further. Um, and then our social sciences team, which is Bobby, they're going to review electronic resources. And, you know, of course, that means I want to pull as much longitudinal data as I can to review, you know, usage, cost per use, turnaways, um, pull in some ILL data. Also, what else is out there in these disciplines that we haven't seen lately? So how would this work? This is for this year. So next year, it'll rotate. So a different team will do a different task. So this will be, I don't know, it didn't work. Um, this will um, rotate from year to year. So 24, 25, and then 25, 26. So in the end, what am I looking forward to in 2026? I'm hoping that, of course, we would love to have a dedicated collection management and assessment position. And I've seen things like that being advertised. So hopefully we'll get that person or a team. Um, but if we can't, I want to create a healthier workload for the liaisons. They're already teaching, they're already doing outreach, they're doing um, so much stuff on top of being tenure track librarians or tenure librarians with research and service. So a healthier workload for them. Um, integrated systematic approach to assessment. Increased outreach to our patrons. Of course, better stewardship of our physical and space. Um, and then, of course, streamline workflows for communication across departments and divisions. So if you're interested in more, Contact me, and hopefully I'll see you in three years. <laughs> with better news. Good morning, everyone. My name is Ray Swishin, and I am Associate Dean of Collections Management and Strategy for Mississippi State University. 
And I'm Kathy Austin. I'm Interim Director for Resource Management at Mississippi State University. And we're going to be speaking with you today regarding enhancing e-resource management, novel new technologies, and new methodological approaches. This presentation is about MSU's collection budget strategy, and Mississippi State University Libraries are using open access, high quality academic resources, and two brand new or fairly new softwares, CloudSource Plus and Article Galaxy Scholar, to leverage your current holdings towards larger budgetary savings and new open access possibilities. Just to explain how this works a little bit, CloudSource Plus leverages our present library journal subscriptions. It also allows us open access savings and access to 60 million high quality open access scholarly resources. Within this, there's 48 million open access referee scholarly articles, <laughs> high quality indexes, and support for our OER and open books, open textbooks uh, systems. Article Galaxy Scholar, the other piece of the equation, allows us budget efficient and focused journal article backup for sources. It checks all of our sources, including our subscriptions, our open access, and our print collection to make sure we're not duplicating resources so we only have to actually pay once for what we don't have in open access or other um, sources in terms of backfilling um, our, our requests for um, journals or collections. And CloudSource Plus aggregates content from high quality publishers. You can see the publishers that um, CloudSource Plus is aggregating in terms of open access, and it's really a stellar list. Everybody ranging from Elsevier to MIT Press to Oxford and Cambridge University uh, Press. This is a large cost benefit strategy. Article Galaxy Scholar fills in and allows us purchase of focused journals and articles of those that aren't available through CloudSource Plus. Again, to begin to summarize this part of the presentation, MSU is using an open access strategy for research uh, collections, and the libraries are use, utilizing Article Galaxy Scholar along with um, CloudSource uh, Plus. Um, Kathy's now going to go over quantitative, qualitative, and data collection and overlap analysis, and how we use that as metrics and for better data-informed budgetary decision-making. So the, the goals for the evaluation process um, at MSU Libraries were to create cost savings for the library's budget while maintaining access to scholarly journals and resources. Um, and also to leverage open access and document delivery services like Article Galaxy Scholar. For the quantitative analysis, we uh, gathered usage statistics, including um, total item requests, searches, investigations, site visits, and unique site visitors. The qualitative analysis um, involves an evaluation form, such as the example here on the slide, which was sent to faculty in the subject areas of the resources being evaluated, asking them to rank the resource and provide comments for or against its purchase. And the stakeholders in this process included the department heads, faculty, and the graduate students who would be most likely using the resource. Uh, additional questions that we used in the qualitative analysis um, included publishing questions to inform our transformative agreements as we leverage open access, as well as an estimate of how many times the faculty had used the resource for their teaching or classes within the past year. And the final component of our analysis uh, was provided by CloudSource which um, was a collection analysis report that showed the amount of open access content included within each resource that we were evaluating. Uh, many of the resources we evaluated included as much as 50% open access content, 
which was data that helped to inform our renewal decisions and whether to rely on the open content and document delivery services and based on the resource usage. And that concludes our presentation. Thank you and please feel free to contact us with any questions. I am the Collection Development Librarian at the University of Utah, <clears throat> and I'm presenting on a small pilot project we ran this summer that we're implementing again this academic year. It's on faculty acquisition trips to help build our area studies collections. Um, I just want to know that I work on this project with my U of U colleagues, John D. Moore, Murray Paiva, and Robert Barrow. So acquisition trips have been a part of libraries since the beginning of libraries. Um, more recently, they're conducted by area studies librarians and bibliographers with subject and language expertise that travel internationally to select and acquire unique uh, vernacular language materials that are unavailable via mainstream library purchasing channels. At our academic library, we no longer have dedicated area studies librarians. Instead, we have uh, subject, subject liaison librarians that allocate about half of their effort to our area studies centers on campus. Uh, we have two, uh, the Asia Center and the Center for Latin American Studies. Both are funded by the Department of Education's Title VI um, grants. Um, so understanding the importance that we're not we're not getting these unique materials because we're not sending faculty, we thought, well, let's add, or we're not sending librarians, we thought we'd ask faculty, because they travel a lot for their research and teaching if they're willing to purchase materials on their trips. So this slide kind of just gives you an overview of our project. It was pretty simple and straightforward. We asked faculty from the centers, we sent them an email, said, hey, if you're traveling this summer and you're willing to select materials on your trip, um, let us know. Um, they, we got three responses. We set up a one hour Zoom meeting with each. We kind of asked them about their knowledge of our library collections, where they were going, uh, what they planned to purchase, and we gave them a one sheet uh, list of guidelines of, you know, to follow on their trip. Um, we informed them that this is a reimbursement project, so um, they have to front the cost on their own, and once they return with their itemized receipts, we'll reimburse them. We set our budget at $1,000. Um, that was because that's the amount the library can reimburse a, a faculty member or an employee without getting additional campus approvals. Um, so, and we told them that that includes any shipping. So they have to budget that, um, all the expenses. And for this pilot project, those funds came from the Title VI grant. So the centers allocate money to the library for us to acquire materials. And so we just kind of set some of that aside. Then we sent them on their way. They went on their trip. Um, and when they came back, we set up another one hour Zoom meeting. Um, and that's really where we learned a lot. Uh, this picture is uh, from the first trip. It was a faculty member from the World Languages and Cultures Department. She teaches and researches Japanese and Korean pop culture. Um, she acquired 120 volumes of Japanese manga. Um, she informed us during our, our pre-trip meeting that our Japanese language um, collection is a little dated, and there um, they have a new course that's a required course for undergrads where they have to, um, it's reading modern Japanese literature, so she wanted to select material specifically for that course. Um, she told us that she wanted a full volume or full sets of, of titles, so all consecutive volumes to encourage ongoing reading. She wanted John, genre beyond action and adventure because that's what our collection already had. Um, she wanted titles that had, had animated adaptations so that the students could read and listen at the same time. And she also selected titles that students had mentioned in her class. Um, she bought quite a few titles, and so we asked her if the $1,000 budget, if she could have used more, and uh, we learned from this that she said, well, no, because I, I'm going on this trip um, for a residency. It took me about a half a day to do this project, to go and go select these materials and ship them. 
Um, and she said, had I had more money, I would have felt more pressure and obligated and it would have been more stressful and we really wanted to make it easy. So that thousand dollar budget actually really worked. Um, so the second trip was also a faculty member from our same department who studies Japanese. Um, he, he teaches and researches on the tale of Genji. Um, so he also selected some manga for that course that they're offering. But he um, also selected a museum catalog, um, a, a unique item for his research. And we told uh, all faculty that it doesn't matter how unique or obscure, obscure the materials are, the library would like you to purchase whatever you want. Um, and so that was kind of an incentive. Um, and even though he might be one of the few people who uses this resource on campus, we're going to put it into our circulating collection so that it can be shared through ILL to support area studies um, throughout the, the country. Um, the difference between these two Japan trips is we learned a lot about shipping. Um, the first person <laughs> shipped via air um, and it got to the US in like several days, like three days. It cost as much as the books cost, but she was still in, in the, the budget range. Um, and this faculty member shipped via ground, so it was on a ship for multiple months. Um, it was a fraction of the cost, um, but the the first faculty member could use them this semester. We were able to process them and get them into our collection. This took a little bit longer, but still, I mean, it works. So now we have that insight to give to uh, faculty in the future. The third trip was a, a faculty member from the Latin American Studies um, Center. His trip got postponed, so we're waiting till late spring for that. In the meantime, another faculty member from the Film and Media Arts contacted us and said, I want to acquire VHSs and DVDs for this uh, Japanese and history um, course that we're going to be teaching in the spring. So this is happening in December. A lot of that conversation centered around like how we can play these, uh, these materials with regional codes, how the library can support them. Um, and so <clears throat> that's it. Thank you. Okay, um, so that concludes our presentations. Does anyone have any questions? And if you do, um, I think we've got a microphone. We're going to come around and, and talk to you.